Well, New Orleans says it learned a lot after Hurricane Katrina dealt it an almost terminal blow nearly six years ago. It's nowhere near perfect there yet, but people there have plenty of insights to share with those who are rebuilding Christchurch. Our reporter Natasha Smith is just back from the city that's known as the Big Easy. The Big Easy. Straddling the Mississippi is the birthplace of jazz and Cajun food. Nowhere else will you find the history, elegant French architecture and, of course, the hive of bars, the buzz that is Bourbon Street. It's a far cry from these images. Six years ago, 80% of the city was underwater. Hurricane Katrina was the largest disaster in US history, killing at least 1,400 people in New Orleans and devastating the city's infrastructure. So how has the city recovered and what can Christchurch learn about rebuilding? It's Tuesday night at Bullets, one of Kermit Ruffin's favourite bars. New Orleans people breathe. Uh, they, they breed and bleed music. I mean, <laughs> music and food is like super in New Orleans. I mean, on any given night, any day of the week, you can go hear maybe 30 bands at 30 different clubs, which is unheard of in most cities. It's hard to imagine almost six years ago this bar was under 10 feet of water. I knew we were going to recover. I didn't have a doubt at all, not one doubt. I just knew it would take a little time to come back. And that was the longest four months of my life. Four months in which Kermit, like most residents, hunkered down in a nearby city. Almost six years on, and though many have returned, the population is only three quarters of what it was before Katrina. About 80% of the city evacuated ahead of time. Alison Plyer has dedicated five years to documenting the impact of Katrina on this city. New Orleans is a city that those of us who live in love dearly. And I think that, you know, the, the real attachment to place and community was a major driver in people wanting to come home. And I think, you know, right after the storm, it was, it was such a horrific event. Um, and a lot of people said, you know, I'm not going back. And um, some of them lived in Seattle or Indianapolis or Houston and after a year or two just didn't feel at home and, um, and ended up coming home anyway. It wasn't just nostalgia that brought these people back. The federal government gave the state $45 billion to rebuild the city. A quarter of that was used to help homeowners. Residents could either have their houses rebuilt or bought by the state if they were moving within the city boundaries. In order to come into the federal subsidies, the federal money, the make good money, you kind of needed to stake out your home and present it as in need of, of, of recovery. And I think a lot of people at that point weren't sure they were going to stay, but they figured, well, if there was anything in it for them, they would have to fix up their house and then try to get rid of it. But inertia plays a, a, a wonderful role in these things, and people instead wind up just kind of settling in. Government assistance was critical. With $150 billion of damage, demand for construction workers skyrocketed. Inflation followed. The cost of rebuilding was so high, um, especially with such a massive event. Um, you know, the cost of materials, the cost of labor all went up. And um, the market was not going to be able to, to subsidize uh, or assist um, all the homeowners who would have needed additional loans in order to rebuild their homes. So, so the government really had to subsidize that, and uh, that was cr critically important. But the government actually spent far more on recovery than rebuilding, and you don't have to travel far to find signs of those who abandoned their city. There are still 60,000 empty and damaged houses in New Orleans. What's quite remarkable is there are many buildings like this still scarred with the marks that defined its contents five and a half years ago. This infamous cross defines who searched the building, what date, and how many bodies were found inside. Oh, look what, oh, look what Sears did my yard. Next to this abandoned house, we found Geraldine Bush, a grandmother and army veteran who has always called New Orleans home. 
A national retail chain paid to fix her house, but there are many here who haven't returned. The old people came back. This is an owner-occupied neighborhood, many homeowners. And uh, we had 500 people, approximately 500 people in this neighborhood to die. So uh, the old people come back, uh, want to come back. The younger people, they go get jobs somewhere else and they don't come back, you know. But uh, that's okay too. She's positive about the city coming back despite the lack of infrastructure. Infrastructure is not up to par. You know, potholes, uh, the water situation, you know, have to renew all the pipes in the city. I don't have, this is an all electric house. I can't have gas because water's in the gas pipes. You know, and uh, there's no hospital here. Uh, they're supposed to be building a hospital in the next parish. There used to be nine hospitals here. Currently, only three are fully operational. And there are fewer doctors, according to Brobson Lutz, an esteemed physician here. He says the city has lost a valuable middle class. We've also lost over 100,000 of our citizens that were a, a part of the fabric, who were part of the day-to-day -day, uh, life of New Orleans, who loved New Orleans, who always bought their shrimp with the heads on. So we've lost a tremendous number of people. I know from a medical standpoint, uh, for a variety of reasons, from uh, practice uh, opportunities to concerns about educating their children. Uh, we lost a tremendous number of doctors from, say, like age 30 to age 50. They just left. Because not everybody has come back, the businesses that used to be here have not come back either. In this suburb, New Orleans East, only half of the residents returned. They have very little here. The national retailers, the Walmart, Starbucks, supermarkets, saw no economic reason to return. You know, the private sector has certainly brought back stores and mom and pop stores, and you know, we have more restaurants than we did before Katrina, for example. But um, corporate America has not paid much attention to New Orleans. Only now is big business coming back with the help of the local Chamber of Commerce. The people in the East now are starting to demand, tear down those buildings, make it look better. We need to change the perception. And the Chamber, we're involved with the businesses out there helping to grow them, we're helping to market them, we're helping bring in national uh, retail relocators. These changes are impossible to achieve without strong leadership. According to Mary Beth Romick, who worked for former Mayor Ray Nagin, now she works for Mayor Mitch Landrieu. It takes a, a mayor and a city le leadership who's not afraid to go to a property owner and say, I'm sorry, you've abandoned it, you haven't done anything with it five years later, we're taking it, we're knocking it down, or we're taking it and selling it and offering somebody else to put it back into commerce, whether it's residential or property uh, for retail or, or business. But it takes hard decisions and it takes a strong leader to make those hard decisions that are sometimes not pleasing to the public. Five years ago, it was strong leadership that would be questioned as New Orleans, like Christchurch now, began to think about the mammoth task of rebuilding. The cemeteries are a popular tourist attraction here, but they also explain very well how the city has been built. You see, you can't dig graves here because most of the city sits at or below sea level. So when the first urban planners came in after Hurricane Katrina, they proposed designated green areas. They said houses should never have been built on marshlands. And if you had a green dot in your area, your house would be demolished. Broadmoor was one of seven areas marked for demolition by Mayor Ray Nagin's Bring New Orleans Back Commission. All hell broke loose in this community when we got that news. And the only way we found out about it was uh, looking at the front page of our local newspaper uh, and seeing a big, uh, big green dot over, uh, over our community. This is an historical suburb close to the city with a high risk of flooding. Latoya Cantrell led her neighbourhood in a fight against the authority. They created their own plan and won. 
we organized ourselves. We uh, did what we said. We were completed. We completed our plan six months after we began planning. Uh, we presented that to the the city council of, of uh, the city of New Orleans. Uh, our plan was embedded in every planning process that this city engaged itself in, which were four different processes. And so the Broadmoor Redevelopment Plan, as it was written by the people of this community, stands today. And so we wasted no time moving from planning to implementation, and we just did not give up. Uh, we were in the face of the powers that be every step of the way. There was enormous pushback. I think, you know, partly because people felt they were entitled to their own homes, partly because the, the federal subsidies and, and make good money flowed to homeowners more, more generously than to people who were basically in transit having abandoned their homes. Community backlash was so strong, Mayor Nagin revoked the plan and disbanded the commission. What followed was 18 months of anarchy. At least four more plans were created by outsiders, non-profit groups, architects or the council. In the meantime, there were some of us who were really just trying to pull together people, planners and, and other leaders in the community to say, we have to figure out how to do this and it has to be something that's inclusive and it has to be something where everybody has a chance to participate. The reunified New Orleans plan was born, coordinated by architecture firm Concordia, funded privately by local foundations. Concordia did something no other plan had done. It broadcast planning ideas to major cities where people had moved. Ultimately, everybody had a chance to participate and vote on what they wanted. We got together in community meetings that you know, probably drove many of us to distraction with their endlessness and, you know, attention to minute details and the working out of very emotional agendas, but that process was therapeutic and it led to stronger communities at a time when, yes, you're also right, the civic leadership was woefully lacking. The result of this bottom-up consultation process is a city built from a melting pot of plans. While that's kept residents happy, others say it comes at a price. We have what we call uh, jack-o'-lantern effect, meaning uh, there's a little bit done here, there's a little bit done here, sort of like the, the teeth on a jack-o'-lantern, the eyes on a jack-o'-lantern. There's a little here, a little here, a little here. Instead of concentrating on one area and uh, saying, uh, uh, making some tough choices and saying to the people, say, in New Orleans East, we're going to provide electricity, sewage, and water to this area. We cannot do the whole area at this time, so we will swap your property, we will give you something equivalent, but we want you to redevelop in this area. You know, we'll know next time there's a terrible storm and flood whether the city, in fact, was reinforced to the point where it's safe to live way out near the swamps or way out near the Gulf. We don't yet know that, but people are living there. And were they betrayed twice, once by the storm and then again by city leadership that failed to lead? Or was there a pure and perfect expression of democracy in their freedom to move back out there. And this is the debate that we will, as I say, be uh, engaged in for, I think, decades to come. Of little debate was the redevelopment of Holy Cross, a Catholic boys' school. Its historic building was badly damaged during Katrina. Though it was much loved, they chose not to restore it and instead built new. The design includes hints of the old school, Replica poles and bricks tie it to the past. Dean de Planchet, who also redesigned the Superdome and Convention Centre, sees rebuilding as a chance for a fresh start. You can either look at it as an opportunity to just repair what we had, or you can look at it as an opportunity to take a fresh look and take the good aspects of what you had and bring them to a new vision that will contribute to a new way of life. This used to be the site of an old church. Now only the cross remains. Ultimately, the people most affected in this neighborhood were very positive about redevelopment of the church project. And they felt to have an opportunity to develop a whole new school that would draw people from outside the directly adjacent neighborhood would further in, enlighten their way of life. Dean also developed this new housing complex. 
Those who live here pay no rent, low rent or full rent. It's one of many to have replaced the government subsidised projects badly damaged in the flood. Deciding what heritage buildings should be kept and restored or what should be pulled down is not easy. Every architect has an opinion about what should happen to the city, what the city should look like. How do you make the decision on whose opinion is best? Everybody has an opinion. But the truth is, as an architect, my opinion is it's the community directly affected that should have most of the input. They were the stakeholders before the disaster. They will be the stakeholders when the repair is done and their families and, and, and uh, relatives will be the stakeholders for the future. To have architects from outside the region, in the case of New Orleans, we had architects from abroad as well as across the country trying to vocally provoke their image of what New Orleans should be from their office in Chicago. And it just does not work. What a Tourism is a major driver in the local economy. People flock here for the music, the food, the events. So it's been vital for the city, both through Katrina and the oil spill, to retain its tourist attractions. The biggest of these, Mardi Gras and Jazz Fest, events that have defined this city over the years. After much debate, the private sector came to the aid of the city and paid for these events to take place less than a year after the storm. And was a, a, a way of, of educating America about what had gone on here. Two lessons, neither of which was always understood in the hinterlands. One was that the city had not ceased to exist, which was one of the rumors out there. The other was that the city was not all the way back together. You've got to be patient. You know? Tommy Satanovich runs one of the oldest seafood restaurants in the city. In the days after Katrina, his restaurant fed 80,000 people for free. Then, meals were discounted to attract tourists. Our city was on sale. We gave, you know, we had to give things, you know, rooms discounted, you know, meals were discounted, you know, airfare, you know, if people aren't going, supply and, you know, supply and demand makes that stuff happen. So, you know, just, just by telling people, you know, bring your small group. I don't care if it's three people, I don't care if it's 300 people. If you got 30,000, bring them too. Tommy hopes his customers will spread the word that New Orleans is a good place to visit. And I tell these people this, I want you to come here, I want you to enjoy our food, I want you to go to our bars and enjoy and have a ball. I want you to go around and check out some of the museums and the river and all of our sightseeing specialties that we have. And then go home and tell everybody about it and be an ambassador for New Orleans. Grassroots efforts. That's the best way to build back your city. Most here will agree that recovery is happening, albeit slowly. Most experts say that it's going to take 10 to 20 years to fully recover because of the scale of the disaster. So, you know, we're almost six years after and we're probably about where we, you would expect to be, you know, six years into a 10 or 20 year recovery. My mom and I driving around town, you know, uh, after, you know, this happened a month, two months later and, you know, it's like, uh, how long is this going to take for us to be back to normal? You know, we were saying five years, ten years. I'm going to tell you, you know what, now looking back six years later, it'll never be back to normal. We've got a new normal now. Might be, I think it's better. We're coming back. Yes. And I'm proud of this city. I usually refer to New Orleans as the queen of the Mississippi, you know. And the queen was just sick for a while. and She's getting back on her feet. And that's okay. <laughs> I love this city. Natasha Smith with that report. Time for a break now, but stay with us because when we come back, Duncan.